Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Town of Air Select meeting of the Air Select special meeting of the Air Select Board for Tuesday, August 6, 2020-24. This meeting hearing of the Air Select Board will be held in person at the location provided on this notice. Members of the public are welcome to attend this in-person meeting. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation via Zoom is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting slash hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast, unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in a specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. This meeting will be live on Zoom. The public may access the proceedings by joining Zoom, meeting ID number 897-9080-0793, or by calling 929-205-6099. For additional information about remote participation, please contact Carly Antonellis, the Assistant Town Manager, at atm at air.ma.us, or 978-772-8220, extension 100, prior to this meeting. We can all stand for it. First item up tonight is going to be hearing from the state legislative delegation for an update on the proposed closing of Neshoba Valley Medical Center. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the Air Select Board and Town Manager Robert Pontran and Assistant Town Manager Carly Antonellis uh, for allowing us to say a few words uh, with this emergency meeting by the Air Select Board uh, to address the, the crisis of the potential closure of the Neshoba Valley Medical Center. Uh, State Senator Jamie Eldridge, uh, very proud to represent Air for 16 years in the Neshoba Valley area for 22 years. And just to think that just, just a week ago in, in the morning on um, uh, late July, uh, we had an incredible rally here of, I think about 300 people of Neshoba Valley Medical Center professional staff, patients, residents, uh, town officials, public safety leaders, uh, community leaders, business leaders uh, to speak out against the uh, potential closure of the Neshoba Valley Medical Center by the financial mismanagement of Stewart Healthcare. So I want to thank everyone for being so responsive with a particular uh, gratitude uh, on the select board. Um, of course, all the select board have, have reached out, but I know in particular uh, Janice Livingston it, it reached out to myself and Representative Cena a few weeks ago, and uh, we have a very close working relationship with Robert Pontbrand and Carly Antonellis, as well as the, the professional staff at uh, Neshoba Valley Medical Center, and especially the, the Union uh, Mass Nurses Association. So in terms of the, the update, um, I, I do just want to uh, provide the latest um, letter. I'm just going to pass this to, to all the select board members of, of the uh, letter that has been signed by more and more elected officials, both legislators and uh, municipal officials, including in Boston, given the potential closure of the, the Kearney Hospital in Dorchester. So this is the latest uh, letter that we have sent to Governor Healy, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, Secretary Walsh, the HHS Secretary, uh, and DPH Commissioner Goldstein. And we first just, you know, the message I just want to say before highlighting the letter is that uh, I want to send a message to, to my constituents in the Neshoba Valley region and all the communities that are served by the hospital that we are at the, at the legislative level as, as legislators for, for this area and, and legislators in the Boston area. We are, we are not giving up, we're continuing, continuing to fight back. And I, I, I hope that people realize that as, as 
Uh, concerning as the situation is, and as, as dire as it is, and to, to be frank, it is dire, that we are seeing a movement by the administration. So hopefully people have seen, and this was largely due to the work of, of many of the people in this room, is that you know Governor Healy now has been clear uh, that there needs to be 120 days before any hospital facility closes. Um, I know that there was a meeting with nurses and Governor Healy last week in Lemonster where there was a productive conversation about providing state funding if there is a qualified bidder uh, for the Shoba Valley Medical Center. And while I don't have all the details about potential bidders, there certainly have been more and more stories about potential bidders uh, for, the, for the hospital. So we're continuing to advocate for that and, and clearly it's critical to have you know, state funding uh, to make that possible, whether it's bridge funding or whether it's uh, support uh, for, for the hospitals um, and the potential new owners. In terms of what, what we have asked the administration for, uh, is that just list the items here is that, and this is in the letter which, it, which is uh, noted on my website, senatoreldridge.com under official correspondence, but it would be to reach out, this is asking the administration, to reach out to any prospective hospital bidder, including Massachusetts Healthcare Networks, to purchase both hospitals. Uh, second, to declare a public health state of emergency, to broaden government powers to keep the two hospitals open. Uh, to provide bridge funding to keep Neshoba Valley Medical Center and Kearney Hospital in operation uh, while negotiations for potential buyers of hospitals. And uh, really to get a stronger commitment from the Healy and Driscoll administration. I, I really want to lift up the fact that you know, the legislature and the governor have just passed and signed a fiscal year budget. We just passed a supplemental budget. So there, there are funds out there that, you know, I believe are, are, are possible to help the Neshoba Valley region. And so we're going to continue to advocate for that. And uh, someone who has also uh, really just been an incredible leader for this area is uh, our colleague, uh, Representative Margaret Scarsdale. Uh, from, from Pepperell, uh, but represents many of the communities, including uh, Groton and Pepperell, is that uh, she has reached out, I know Representative Cena and I have begun to do it as well, is reach out to all of our public uh, safety leaders, so, you know, for the most part, our fire chiefs, uh, to make sure it's very clear to DPH Commissioner Dr. Robert Goldstein that um, it would be an absolutely devastating impact for uh, EMS and, and fire departments uh, for the safety of, of tens of thousands of residents in the Neshoba Valley region if the Neshoba Valley Medical Center were, were to close. Talking about obviously the, the extra time it would take for, to, for, to bring a, an, an ambulance or other emergency vehicle to another hospital that could be 20, 25 or 30 minutes away. Um, that the very close partnership the Neshoba Valley Medical Center has with the, with the fire service and EMS in these communities uh, would, would, obviously, would obviously be gone. And communicating to Public Health Commissioner Goldstein that you know, his mission obviously is to ensure proper healthcare access for every region of Massachusetts. And that would have an extremely detrimental effect if, if the hospital would, would close. So um, I, would, uh, I would close and say to, the, to, to Chairman Copeland is, is thank you so much to the select board for, for reaching out to us. Um, again, this is uh, just the latest in correspondence we're doing. It's, it's obviously a, a sort of quickly evolving discussion around both hospitals, but I do think that we've gotten the governor's attention, we've clearly gotten the, the media's attention, and, and so grateful for the grassroots work, the work of, of the nurses, doctors, uh, the Mass Nurses Association, uh, and, and residents here in general uh, for all their terrific work, and, and really, again, really want to echo my appreciation to Robert Pontpran, to Carly Antonellis, and the select board for taking such quick action and, and I'm hopeful for, for quick action tonight. So, thank you so much. Um, well, good evening everyone. Thank you um, for to allowing us to say a few words here tonight. I, I echo what Senator Eldridge has said. I mean, we, we have worked with uh, uh, together to send a letter to the governor's office, to the Department of Human Services, and, and also I, we, uh, my office sent a letter to the Attorney General 
uh, requesting to use every tool that you can to delay this closure. Now, certainly I've heard from many, many constituents and many residents that they lived in, in air or they want to live around this area because of the hospital, because of the quality of life uh, they're giving to the residents. And, and certainly I have relied on the Shoba myself for health care. Uh, so certainly it's going to impact all of us. And what can we do? I mean, my goal or my hope for the future on this um, uh, closure, if it does indeed happen, and, and it looks like at least there's nothing changing. And I would like to see those bits more transparency. We would like to see more uh, information so that we, the public is aware of who is a potential buyer. Um, m during this crisis, I received a call from a doctor who, who said that the best care, the best method for us to provide care without this to avoid some of these corruption that are kind of happening, this mismanagement, if I may say, with those, those funds or profits, um, is for a nonprofit. Um, to 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 govern or to uh, take over a new facility, and and so my goal is that we have a transition. Um, we're working together with the public and with with uh, the government officials to see what we can do. But my hope is that there is a a, a, a nonprofit that can come and, and take over. But I, I know that it's uh, not in our control at the moment. But we're certainly applying pressure um, and having these conversations with uh, the stakeholders to make sure that. The there's a, a transition that, that at least that's what I hope um, to see and certainly we don't want any care to be um, you know not provided we certainly I'm sure the state would do everything we can to provide those funds if, if it is necessary for us to you know have a, a transition but don't know where that stands yet um, but certainly would have my our support Thank you, uh, Senator Eldred and State Rep. Uh, Senna. Our next agenda item is going to be reading the Select Board's official resolution re requesting emergency declaration regarding the proposed closure of the Neshoba Valley Medical Center into the record. Board Member Livingston. Official resolution requesting emergency declaration regarding the proposed closure of the Neshoba Valley Medical Center. August 6, 2024. We, the duly elected Air Select Board, given the impending proposed closure of the Neshoba Valley Medical Center, NBMC, scheduled for August 31st, 2024, officially implore that Governor Maura Healy of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts exert her leadership and official powers to prevent the closure of the NMFVMC including, but not limited to, declaring a state of public health emergency to prevent the closure of the NVMC, in addition to formally adhering to the 120-day closure process in accordance with Massachusetts state law. Whereas the NVMC in Air, Massachusetts is a 46-bed community hospital opened in 1964, which has continuously provided primary critical health care, including emergency health services, to the 15 towns of the Neshoba Valley region of Air, Ashby, Bolton, Boxborough, Devons, Dunstable, Groton, Harvard, Lancaster, Littleton, Pepperell, Shirley, Stowe, Townsend, and Westford, with a combined population of approximately 114,391. Additionally, the Neshoba Valley Medical Center provides critical secondary emergency care to the other communities of North Central Massachusetts and Southern New Hampshire and, whereas the NVMC receives approximately 16,000 emergency room visits annually, and receives approximately 91,000 outpatient visits annually and, whereas the NVMC is geographically positioned in a key location to provide central, direct health care and emergency services to rural communities which do not have access to public mass transportation for patients to travel beyond the region for health care and emergency health services including our most vulnerable populations of the elderly, disability, community, and children, and whereas currently the Town of Air's emergency response, advanced life support, averages a 15 to 20 minute return to service when transporting to the NVMC, which is only 2.4 miles from the air fire station. 
The closest alternative hospitals to the town of Ayr are as follows. Lemonster Hospital, 11.5 miles. Emerson Hospital, 16.8 miles. Lowell General, 19.7 miles. And Southern New Hampshire, Nashua, 18.6 miles. If NVMC closes air emergency response is estimated to take critical services out of the response areas for up to an additional of one to one and a half hours, assuming no traffic and ideal weather conditions. Additionally, these increased response times will have a significant negative impact on emergency survival rates, as well as increased unfounded costs for emergency services for the towns of the Neshoba Valley and Whereas the NVMC is one of the largest employers of the Town of Air and the Neshoba Valley region, employing approximately 500 jobs, the loss of jobs and negative income impact to the local and regional economy will be devastating and... Whereas the NVMC to date has not received a viable bidder to assume the operations of the hospital and the federal bankruptcy judge on July 31st, 2024 ruled that Stewart Medical the current owner and operator of NVMC, to proceed with closing the hospital by August 31st, 2024, in only 30 days as opposed to the 120 days per Massachusetts state law, and whereas the impending closure of the NVMC by August 31st, 2024, will create a health care desert, desert in the Neshoba Valley region, impacting over 100,000 residents of the Commonwealth, increased emergency response times to over an hour, cut off direct local access to the public health care to the region's most vulnerable populations, create the loss of over 500 jobs, and shutter the entire emergency response service for the 15 towns of the Neshoba Valley Medical Center, a man-made public health emergency currently exists. And, Whereas Governor Maura Healy has the power set forth in Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 17, Section 2A, as follows. Upon de 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 declaration by the governor that an emergency exists which is detrimental to the public health, the commissioner may, with the approval of the governor and the public health council, during such period of emergency, take such action and incur such liabilities as he may deem necessary to assure the maintenance of public health and the prevention of disease. The commissioner, with the approval of the Public Health Council, may establish procedures to be followed during such emergency to ensure the continuation of essential public health services and the enforcement of the same. Now, therefore, the Air Select Board respectfully requests that Governor Maura Healy take the following immediate actions within her powers as Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as follows. One, per Mass General Law, Chapter 17, Section 2A, declare that a public health emergency exists with the impending closure of the NVMC and further instruct Dr. Robert Goldstein, Commissioner of the Department of Public Health to take such action to assure the maintenance of public health by keeping the NVMC open and operational. Two, that the governor, per her public statements on August 1st, 2024, that Stewart should adhere to the 120-day closure per Massachusetts state law, do everything in her power as governor to ensure the 120-day closure period. Three, that the governor work with the federal, state, and local leaders of the Neshoba Valley to develop a permanent transition plan with funding to ensure that the NVMC remains open and operational and ultimately transfers to a responsible owner. We, the Air Select Board, hereby issue this official resolution on August 6, 2024 from the Air Town Hall, Air Massachusetts, and officially transmit, transmit this official resolution to Governor Maura Healy, Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and Dr. Robert Goldstein, Commissioner of the Department of Public Health of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, with official copies transmitted to Congresswoman Lori Trahan, State Senator Jamie Eldred, State Senator John Cronin, State Senator Edward Kennedy, State Representative Danella Senna, State Representative Mark Ritzgarsdale, State Representative James Arciero, State Representative Michael Kushmerick, State Representative Natalie Higgins, and official copies to the select boards of the 15 affirmation towns of the Neshoba Valley region. Signed this sixth day of August 24 by Sean C. Copeland, Chair, Christopher E. Tavares, Vice Chair, Janice L. Livingston, Clerk, the Air Select Board.
Thank you, Board Member Livingston. Next, I'd like to open up to a public question and answer period um, for questions and answers specific to the Neshoba Valley Medical Center. And if we could please only use up to two minutes since there's a large crowd here. I'd like to welcome you up to the microphone if you would give your name and your address. And then Carly, if you could tell me when people want to. Sure, thank you. Mr. Chair, can I speak? Oh, absolutely. Please. So I've been here 19 years, which makes me kind of a newcomer to this region. Um, but within the first year of living here, I had uh, a little bit of a health scare. First time going to Neshoba Valley uh, Medical Center, and you know I was treated well, and it comforted me to know that this place exists, existed. Um, you know, within a couple of years later, you know, there was another just a little injury that my wife had. Same thing, just went up there, knew that this existed, and um, when my daughter was about three years old. She was dancing in our living room. She, she fell, landed awkwardly on her arm, and it was a Sunday night, 9 p.m., and we knew we could go right up to Neshoba Medical, get her checked out, and she was back home with her cast within a couple hours. And you know, as a father, an injury to your child is you know, more concerning than anything in the world. And, and having this place here, it just, you know, made us all feel safe. Going into this uncharted area of, you know, if this does close, you know, I'm scared. And I think we all are scared too, right? That's why we're here. And I look out now and I see all the support. Really, anything that I've ever dealt with that can be, you know, in a public forum, you're gonna have 50-50. You can have these people against, these people for, you can have a lot of arguments. Raise your hand if you're against this place closing. Yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I, I worded that very poorly. Okay. <laughs> so, how about a show of hands? Who wants this place closed? Hey, look at that. 100%, when have you ever seen that in the town hall? Everyone here, straightforward, wanting the same thing. So I know Governor Healy is a basketball person. This one's a layup. This one is very easy. Come out here and speak with us. We have beautiful you know, restaurants, coffee places. Come out here, see us, talk to us. Once you see what this will do to not just this town, these people here, the whole entire region, it becomes so simple. So please, Governor Harry Healy, come out here, talk to us, break the silence, and keep NVMC open. and I was born in the hospital that is now Neshoba Assisted Living. There has been a hospital in this town, I, I believe since like 1929, 24, okay. Uh, I, I, yeah, I could have, I might, I might have forgotten that right. But my point is, is that there's always been a hospital and the idea that this is gonna be taken away. But what's really, really bothersome to me at this particular moment, because we know we have the support, is that the idea that Governor Healy, you have come across as like you're not paying attention to us. And it, between this hospital and Kearney, you're talking of approximately 300,000 people being negatively affected. There is no winning on this deal. And yet I have seen more conversations about you and your ice cream trip than I have about you and this scenario. And it's great that you had a conversation with people last week, and it's great that they gave, you gave them 10 minutes instead of a one minute, which who has any time to say anything in a one minute? Is, is you know, that's great, you, you finally heard, okay? But here's the thing, Governor Healy, you, when you ran, you promised to be a leader. And yet, you are not, because a leader, 
will look around to see what their people need and make sure that they've done everything in their power to make sure that their people have all the supplies, resources, support, whatever is needed. So Governor Healy, be a leader and support this hospital and Kearney staying open because 300,000 lives, that's just the people that live here. Now some of you are gonna have company, okay? And God forbid, they need assistance, okay? The, so, and now let's do the ripple effect. Okay, some are people are gonna go to Lemonster Hospital. They can't handle it. They can't handle what they have already. They're not gonna be able to handle all. So now, what could have been done in one, two hours, four, six. Oh my God, we forgot you were still in that bed over there. That is a scenario that's gonna happen. And it's not because they didn't care, it's because they're overwhelmed. And there is no reason for this situation. So Governor Healy, be a leader and let the people here know that you're paying attention and that you care. Thank you, Board Member Livingston. I don't like public speaking, so I'm not really going to say much. <laughs> Other than I would like to also reiterate that I invite the governor to please come and speak with us. Come see the town, come see the people that are going to be affected by this. Um, as somebody who worked my last job, I spent a lot of time at the Lemonster Hospital Emergency Room. I can't imagine the negative outcomes that are going to happen when our EMS services have to go out to Lemonster or to Emerson and how bad that's going to be for calls that come after that. Um, when those EMS services are already out. Um, so just reiterate what my colleague said, and please, Governor Gerley, please come out and see us um, and fight for Neshoba Valley Medical Center. Now, if there's anybody who would like to come up to the microphone. My name is Audra Sprague. I'm a registered nurse at Neshoba Valley Medical Center. I can't thank you enough for that letter. That's exactly what we need is for her to declare a public health emergency and then, you know, things get rolling into place that can help, sorry, help save us and save the hospital. Um, where she now has said that she wants to support the 120 days, what, and Senator Elford, you probably know, what can she do or has she done since she said that? to like back it up and kind of teeth to it. Is there you know any steps that she has taken or is planning on taking that you know of to do that? Yeah, if I just through the through the chair, um, thank you, Audrey, and thank you so much for having that meeting with, with uh, Governor Healy um, and speaking out the rally last week is um, yeah that is part of our letter is 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 okay we appreciate Governor Healy um, saying that she was going to you know require the 120 day notice, but we, we myself, Rep. Cena and the legislative delegation specifically asked for a letter to be sent to the bankruptcy court um, because it, it it is implied that the administration was okay with the yeah. closure by August 31st. So to, to say that we do not support the immediate closure and that we demand uh, and enforce through DPH Commissioner Goldstein, the hundred, at the very least, the hundred and twenty day notice. But but that correspondence has not happened yet. So yeah. that's that's why we sent this latest letter. Great. And also, just for an update, um, on Sunday night, just for a time thing that we're talking about with EMS, Pepperell, which is one of the towns that Neshoba gets quite a few patients from, had to go to Emerson at ten o'clock at night, and their turnaround time with no traffic, and they got off pretty quick. They said they got the patient off the stretcher onto a bed. Their full turnaround time was two hours and fifteen minutes for one wow. call. So, and that's with no you. traffic. With no traffic, ten o'clock at night. Thank you. So. My name is Ed Gossite, I 109 Thompson Street, Pepper Mass, and uh, oh, 28 years ago. I uh, was having a heart attack. I was taken to uh, Neshoba, and uh, 
They got me out of there in a matter of minutes. Air flight and down the whole stuff. So, I hate to see it go, you know. Very important to me. And the other thing that really bothers me every time I read it in the newspaper is this guy who owns it demands that his debts are taken over by the buyer. I've never heard of such a thing. These bankruptcy laws are absurd. I mean, could you file bankruptcy and say, hey, my neighbor's going to take my debts if he wants to buy my house? I mean, it's, it's just absolutely crazy. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stone Soup Kitchen. Um, I just want to advocate for people who do not have transportation. We live in an area that does not have public transportation, not reliable public transportation. And um, I know that you're all working. I'm not yelling at you or anything. I'm just bringing forward that there are quite a number of people that I love very, very much that if this hospital closes down, I honestly don't know what they're going to do. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Peter Cunningham. I'm a select board member of the town of Broughton, and I appreciate uh, the action that you've taken on this, this letter. I want to bring this back to my board and uh, work with them on crafting some, something similar to send to the, uh, to the administration of Governor Healy. I've also been disappointed with Governor Healy's uh, reaction on this. It seems like Kearney and the Shelby Valley Medical Center have sort of been collateral damage in this whole process going forward between the bankruptcy court. And I understood that the Commonwealth had an attorney that was a, a party to that proceeding down there. I don't know if there was a, a motion to appear or not, but it was a proceeding. But I don't, I don't think the urgency in what I've seen reported of the situation here is getting communicated down there. And the bankruptcy judge is making the decisions on those proceedings based on sort of a narrow vision of who the debtors are and, and we have to make whole again, but not what the impacts are. Uh, and bankruptcy law, I guess, is a little convoluted. I don't understand it all, but it's, it's it, for, for a, a process like this to go forward and, uh, and, and impact this region in the way it is, is just unacceptable. Uh, so I appreciate all the advocacy of our legislative delegation. Senator Hill has certainly been taking the lead on this, and, and Rep. Senator Rep. Scarsdale. Um, but, but we certainly need to communicate that this is not acceptable, and Governor Hillary needs to be more aggressive uh, in making sure this doesn't happen. So thank you very much for this. That's how we take care of it. 
So I can understand quite honestly why the, uh, the, the Massachusetts and Governor Haley is upset with Stewart. I'm upset with Stewart. We're all upset with Stewart. I can't believe a corporate road and corruption institute than they have. But to think that we're going to let Stewart continue to victimize the patient, our, our, our population and our, the people who live in this area, I just don't want our patients to continue to be collateral damage. And to, and to know that we have perhaps the means, the governor Haley has the means in which to right this wrong and not do so, to me is morally unconscionable. So, you can see I'm pretty worked up about this. But this has been my life, caring for this community and the many, the many communities that this hospital service is a lifelong work. It's a lifelong work for people who work at the hospital from post cleaning to maintenance for the nursing staff to everyone. So to close this hospital is a gem. It, it can never be it can never be replaced. And it would be just an absolute tragedy to see this place closed when there is really no need for it to be. here about six years now, and Dr. H fixed my knee when I broke it two years ago. <laughs> I'd like to understand what a qualified bid is. It seems like there have been a lot of facilities who've made offers, and if it's just up to Steward, how is an organization that failed at keeping this hospital going able to be responsible for determining Who's qualified to run it now? Okay. Uh, I'll just, if I could just, I, I don't have an exact answer for that. Maybe cheap. Um, but um, e excellent question. And, and I think that the hope now is, you know, given that the bankruptcy court has, and the judge has made a decision. But now there's this window for a separate purchaser, right, for the, for the two hospitals, and therefore there's a little more, uh, uh, the, the standard, if you will, shifts more to, to the administration, the Healy Driscoll administration, uh, that could uh, work to, to secure qualified bidders for the two hospitals. So that's, that's the short explanation of, of how this is an opening, and completely agree that Stewart is clearly should 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 not have uh, nor should should be evaluating what what is and isn't a qualified bidder. So thank you. Mr. Chair, Chief Johnston, uh, if I might add the EMS component part of this. Um, so I'll speak first on behalf of the town of Mayor. We're fortunate enough where we staff our station with a combination department where we have four career staff and we backfill with either off-duty members or call department members. So we're able to staff our two ALS ambulances at the paramedic level all the time. Having said that, we all here understand that most of that time now is going to be spent, rather than say an ambulance tied up for 40 minutes total, we're going to realize that that time is going to be pushed out to an hour, an hour and a half. So we understand those two ambulances could be on the road more than they ever have been. But as Select Board Member Tavares uh, said, we're entering uncharted waters. We're just guessing at that time. We don't know how quick they'll be able to get the person off our stretcher, you know, at the receiving facility. So those numbers are just, you know, our best guesstimates. We really don't 
have a sample, you know, until the hospital was closed. And as such as uh, Audra said, you know, Pepper was over two hours. So those are the things we face. And I think behind the scenes, collectively, um, we've been meeting with all the departments that are affected by that, you know, fire chiefs, EMS coordinators, to see what our best, you know, along with the DPH representatives, which were assigned to us when the news first broke. So I think it's important to remember, like the services will be there, we just don't know, so we can get two paramedic ambulances out, but we don't know what the next, what's the next call gonna you know, be. Is it a mutual aid ambulance? Are we gonna be able to get somebody there in a fire truck to help that person? And this goes across the Neshoba Valley area. But keep in mind, collectively, the fire chiefs and the people who run the EMS departments are working on that behind the scenes, but it really is uncharted waters because our budgets are set. This certainly will cost more money as we move forward if the hospital were to close. And like I said, we have combination departments. You know what I mean? We don't have larger career departments where, you know, throughout the region there's small numbers. And once you take that, specifically that ambulance out of the region for a little bit, it's a longer time frame before they're back into that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm not from Air, I'm from Shirley. My name is Tenny Comar, and I'm gonna ask the attorney here, uh, Senator El um, Eldridge, a legal question, okay? Being as that's been my emergency room for some other medical doctors, and I've been taken there at two o'clock in the morning by ambulance, and uh, I have a question. Uh, why not? deal with this private equity mess that we have, which I hope uh, brings about a national law of change, why can't we just imminent domain the buildings? Amen. Okay? I mean, years ago we had Bain Capital come in and shut down Toys R Us. I mean, who takes a toy store away from children? Okay, private equity is doing this like same thing to uh, all over the place, and this is and uh, they're doing this to mobile home parks. They're taking land out from underneath people. There are many other businesses. The problem is, is that immediately when it was bought, you know, for-profit hospital, the land, the building was immediately switched into a trust. Okay, and then this is where the problem lies, is the insane mortgage payments. Like I said, imminent, do <clears throat> in, uh, imminent domain for the public good, um, I, it, that's what goes through my head. Anyway, thank you. Spencer Lane, 31 Coolidge Road. Actually, I've only lived here a few years, but uh, I guess I really just have a question about because I've lived in a few places before. I'm, I'm almost uh, 68 years old. I've never seen a hospital have to shut down just because of financial issues. I, I mean, I, I know some get outdated and they, they can't be restored, but just strictly for financial issues because of mismanagement. So I guess my, one of my questions, or my main question is, who was representing the hospital and the community at the, uh, at the hearings in Texas? Was there anybody there? And if not, why wasn't there? I think that's an excellent question. I mean, I don't think anybody was. No. Nope. That's an excellent question. I've been asking myself that question too. Uh -huh. One would think that the state would have sent someone there. I mean, this is this isn't like a normal bankruptcy. This is like a, a factory that's going out of business. Are they not going to be manufacturing widgets in the town anymore? I mean, this is this is something that people's lives depend on, and uh, I think there 
should have been some accountability at, that, uh, at the hearings. I understand that the judge even had some comments about what was going on, but his hands were tied or something, I don't know. So anyway, I guess that's it. I'm wondering. Mr. Chair? Yes, I'm wondering. So I, I think Senator Markey had a letter to the judge. It's my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as the judge, I think the only question he could answer was about the bankruptcy. But I agree. Where was the state? And where was the state? They think, knew what I mean, the knew was going to be. Uh, the governor knew about this. I mean, it's not like the, the bankruptcy hearing was going on without her knowledge. or It didn't blindside her. She knew it was going to happen. Where, where was she? All right. That's my only question. What? I'm sorry. Another question we can ask Governor Healy if she comes to right. see us. Well, I think that part of the problem, Mr. Chair, is that, you know, right away upon the announcement of the hospital being foreclosed, well, first there was the confusion of everything got a bid, and then the next day it was like, oh no, two did, or a qualifying bid. But then the, uh, the uh, governor announced, like, oh, we're going to, don't worry, we, we knew this was coming, but we're going to create a database because those always work. <laughs> and we're, so that you're gonna know where you can go. Well, first of all, databases take a while to get up and running, we all know that. But there again is, that what a defeatist attitude that was. You know, oh, we knew this was gonna happen, but we're building a, da a database. Why not have boots on the ground? Again, ice cream trail, got a lot of recognition and a lot of talk, hospital, oh, we're gonna build a database. So explain that to me. But then you add on the other problem is that, it, did the cap get removed from Devons for housing? Did that get changed? That, that has not passed yet. That oh, that has not passed yet? No, no. But that is being considered, which yes. would mean more housing could go mm -hmm. on to Devons, right. which we all agree, housing is needed. <laughs> but you might want to think twice before you move here because there's going to be no health services okay so so how governor healy can you want to do that because you want to you know get a roof over people's head which we all agree we all want a roof over head some people might have kids in their basement they want out who knows <laughs> some of you're going yeah <laughs> but we're not going to have health services which will now make it even worse. Okay, so again, Governor Healy, you have shown us a defeatist attitude, and we need you to step up to the plate. We're, you're capable of it. You were Attorney General, you're Governor. You're capable of stepping up to the plate, but we need you to step up to the plate for this, because lives are at stake livelihoods are at stake this cannot happen it is just unfathomable that we're even discussing this and and like the gentleman said that if this hospital is not closing because it's run down it couldn't be repaired it's closing down because someone on a yacht with two planes that a board of directors gave him a hundred million dollar umbrella hell could be more oh boy, i think i said a four letter word i'm so sorry um, you know, that, that, that even the, any board of directors thinks that that's acceptable? No. Everything has to change. But right now, Governor Healy, we need you to front and center on this issue. Amen. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Senator Archer. If I could just add to what uh, Select Board Member Livingston said about about Devons, and, and this is a letter that uh, Representative Cena and I just got maybe two hours ago. But to, to Select Board Member Livingston's point, um, there is a, a letter um, from the Devons Enterprise Commission, and I, I won't read the whole letter, but one of the paragraphs says to the point of you know not just sort of the the human impact, but the, the economic impact, the potential closure of the Neshoba Valley Medical Center, uh, 
the third paragraph says, uh, quote, the closure of Neshoba Valley Medical Center will have significant impacts on a large vulnerable population, as well as the many social support services within Devons, including Terra Vista Behavioral Health Center, Clear Path for Veterans, Transitions Women's Shelter, Loaves and Fishes Food Pantry, and Shriver Job Corps, not to mention the Federal Bureau of Prisons in Devons in Shirley. With our aging and at-risk populations in Devons and the surrounding region, the need for the services that Neshoba Valley Medical Center continues to grow. So I just want to note that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Elton. I'm sorry, the name? Oh, okay. Pepin? Ms. Pepin? Melanie Pepin. Okay, we can come back to her, Ms. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Pauline Conley, Cambridge Street. I'm smiling. I'm not here to con contradict anything you say. I echo everything you have said. We all know that bankruptcy filing was done in May, so this is not new news to most of us. A couple of concerns um, from what I've read about the court proceedings. The Commonwealth was represented. I believe the law firm is named Denton's, something I've never heard of before, but they may well be a Texas-based law firm because that's where the bankruptcy filing is located. I believe the MNA was uh, represented as well, but it was a firm I also didn't recognize. Multiple name firm, Senate, you may recognize it. Also probably based in Texas. I read a comment, a quote, from Judge Lopez, who said, and I have multiple articles on my phone, I was trying to download them today, and it didn't work. But anyway, the judge said he was conflicted with granting the order to close the hospitals on August 31st because there was no opposition to Stewart's motion. I had no, no knowledge of whether that was true or not, but at least it's a quote, a quote from the judge. Perhaps we need to contact him. As far as supporting everything you do, I will not change that position. I will support all you do and all you try to do as representatives of the, uh, the elected, the residents of there. But what I would like to ask the board, not necessarily tonight, but to address the concern on Facebook that we just take the land by eminent domain. We've been down that road in the past. We took Depot Square by eminent domain. We were asked to take Devon's Crest. We made a very strong statement, the board did, about the fact that we couldn't do that. The public needs to understand the process, to know it could take one to two to three years and cost us millions, millions in tax dollars. So I would hope that you will address that in the next meeting or at least issue a statement so everybody understands full well what that entails. It's not just go up there and take the keys. It's go up there and hand them a check for millions and millions of dollars. And that is negotiated, as we all know, or most of us know. So I would ask that you do that for your next meeting. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Even better. So, because the news media is Oh, I know. So, so is it? We're closer? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <coughs> oh, I usually have people telling me to back away from the mic. <laughs> so, now I, have, now I don't know what to do. Um, so, here's the thing. As, as we've all seen on numerous occasions in our lives, whether it be local or in the news for another state, Connecticut, uh, uh, you know, about a decade or so, um, eminent domain does not happen overnight. For the town of Ayr, in, for example, to take eminent domain, first of all, there'd have to be a few conversations, so there's a few meetings, okay? There would have to be a review into like, well, if we did think about this, where would we get the funding from? Because this is the estimated, and in this case, it's probably billions, okay? Uh, 
and then you've got to go to town meeting okay so you got to declare it then you got to have town meeting well you have to have a certain amount of days before you can even have town meeting all right and now town meeting everybody's going to be for it until they hear how much it's going to cost them and that's the thing we don't have the money for it okay the state does maybe but this town does not and then you go into land court, so then you gotta haul that months of thing. Meanwhile, the hospital's closed because we're, all, and it could take years. So I can tell you that if I thought that I could snap my fingers and it could be done, I would, okay? Because this impacts all of us. But unfortunately, eminent domain is not an option because even if then we took it over, who's running it? We can't handle running it. So then we'd have to have to cut some type of board reformed to be able to run the thing and everything. That's just not in the cards for the local level, okay? But is it something that maybe should at least be discussed? That's what I'm saying. They don't have this defeated attitude. You should be standing out there saying, okay, today we're looking at this option. Okay, to come back tomorrow. Oh, that one didn't work. But while we were talking about that option, we said we into this, and now we're talking about this. And you explore every option. Every option. So that when you go to bed at night, you know you have looked at every option. And again, we have not seen that from this administration. Come out and tell us that you're looking at something. Then come out and say, okay, that one didn't work, but we're gonna look at this. But instead, we've got this defeatist attitude. Well, you know what? We don't have it. The administration has it, but we're not going down without an argument. I'm uh, Zoe Harris. I'm from 50 Groton Harvard Road. Um, I just want to point out that I was born in Fitchburg Hospital. And that doesn't exist anymore, which, so this is an alarming trend in the area for my lifetime. Um, I understand that the 30-day ruling was a federal ruling in Texas, which is kind of mind-boggling that this court in Texas can have such an impact on our lives here in Mitchell Valley. Um, and the 120 day notice is a state law. So is that part of the problem? Is that we're dealing with a federal ruling versus a state law of the 120 days? Is, is, does the federal supersede that in that case? And if we declare the state of emergency that we're requesting, will that supersede everything? That's my question. <laughs> I, I am a lawyer that I do not practice one on television. <laughs> but um, that's a great question, and I think that's something that we've been analyzing is, is bankruptcy court obviously being federal, you know, how, how does that relate to, to state law? But we, we do believe it is possible for, for uh, you know, under the public health emergency, under the, the state DPH guidance of 120 day notice, for that to be invoked by the administration. And so Governor Healy has talked about that for the first time last week, thanks to a lot of the advocacy in this room. And you know, now we'd like that to be strictly enforced. So we, we do think it's possible, but we, we, are, we are looking to get a uh, more specific answer on that. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Cunningham again. I just I'd like to ask a question, I guess, of um, Senator Eldridge and, and Ramsina. Uh, I had understood that what's happened here is a textbook example of how a for-profit uh, enterprise coming in and basically pillaging a resource and, and walking away with their, you know, with all their uh, ill-gotten gains. Um, but that there had been a bill filed in the legislature to do something on hospital reform or governance reform. Can you tell us where did that? Go forward, or is that still before the legislature? Yes. Yeah, so the uh, so the the, um, the Senate uh, did pass the legislation just because uh, the, the House, to its credit, had passed a, a bill around community hospitals. But the Senate more recently, in the face of the 
steward crisis included legislation that uh, would have provided closer reviews of, of any hospital that is owned by private equity, because uh, obviously that's the foundational problem. Um, so that did pass in the Senate, and now there's a negotiation between the House and Senate, uh, you know, hopefully to pass in an informal session. Um, there was a colleague of mine in the Senate did pass legislation to give the governor greater powers to maintain health care services uh, if a hospital were to close. I, I did vote for that, but it did not did not pass the Senate. So clearly, it's you know it's it's a bit of a, a moving uh, entity in the sense that these things are just coming upon us, and we're, we're trying to get as educated as possible in the legislature. I mean, I appreciate how laws you know pass at this point are probably too late for the situation, but but great urgency I think needs to be applied uh, to, to getting legislation passed that uh, could prevent something like this from happening again because it's just, uh, you know, we, we find ourselves in a position we're in because we don't have the tools or perhaps the governor doesn't have the tools uh, to do what, what needs to happen. So. If I may say, I mean, we, the fact that the bill, there was a provision on the bill that talked about the land issue, what the steward did uh, to prevent that from happening in the future. Um, I will say that looking throughout the past years, the fact that the state have helped Stewart with millions of dollars year after year, um, to a point in which later on we found out this is not feasible. Um, the fact that any, any private entity, whether the, if the state is providing some assistance or some support, that those finances needs to be public information. That needs to be disclosed. And the fact that this was not the case here with Stewart, and we're asking for those numbers, I mean, the fact that that's the case, I mean, we need to make sure that that's, that doesn't happen. Um, so um, it, it, it's infuriating to see what has happened to us as, as residents, as patients, as, uh, and I'm sure the people that work at the hospital, they want to be, work there, they want to provide care, and I, thank you for that doctor who gave a so powerful state, statement, thank you. Um, it, it's just very, very concerning, and certainly thank you for your question, because we, we have attempted uh, to try to you know, um, minimize the, the, the impact, but uh, we, we need to look ahead. I think we need to look in the future uh, and, uh, and see how we, the best way, the best method for us to provide health care. And I think we have to have a discussion on what uh, entity, who do we want. Um, certainly, uh, you know, we have bills, we have uh, ways to, you know, health care for all, and, and to make sure the government has a stake, has a role in that, because certainly this is, Public. It's, a, it's a public entity. It's, a, it's something where we rely just to, to, to be able to live. Uh, so we don't want a, a private entity to be controlling all of that. And I think that's why we are here today. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, Matthew Murphy. I live at 95 Washington Street. So kind of a statement and then a question. So the first is, when they declared bankruptcy back in March or May, my suggestion going forward for the administration or any future administration is let's take them at the word that they're bankrupt and start planning for a closure then. Because they may have said, oh, we're going to find a buyer, but their credibility is not the greatest. Um, so in the future, I would take that back as, as soon as one of these healthcare entities declares bankruptcy, start planning for the worst case scenario from that day one and figure out how we're gonna make this work. Um, the second is the statement's great. What you guys put out is great. How do we move the ball on this as citizens and get this done? Because we're now, the, the clock's ticking. We're now in a two minute drill. How do we make this work? How do we get this finished <coughs> over the ball or over the goal line? Sorry for all the sports metaphors, but um, that's what I'm best at. <laughs> so how do we help? What, do we, what can we do as citizens that all came up and took time out of our ten, uh, day and, and away from our families to help you guys? So. Thank you, yeah. Thank um, you. I, just this morning, or this afternoon, I got a call from EPH uh, that tomorrow they're going to announce um, an in-person hearing on Thursday, August 15th at 6 o'clock at the Devon's Common Center and a Schober virtual hearing on Monday, um, August 19th at 6 p.m. And, and, and to, to also, we, we did, we're reaching out to the, the chiefs 
um, of the, the area, uh, particularly I represent Shirley, Ayer, Harvard, um, and Groton. Um, so reaching out to those chiefs and having a, a, a conversation with uh, the Commissioner Goldstein um, on, on this to, to find out, okay, what, what are we doing moving forward? Um, and so I think that's very important that we, we're keeping those dialogue and those discussions happening. Um, so. Yeah, so uh, this is going to be public tomorrow. I, um, I did ask if I could share this idea. Um, Thursday, um, August 15th at 6 p.m. at Devon's Common Center. And then the virtual hearing on Monday, August 19th at 6 p.m. Um, and this is from DPH Scheduled Social Service Closure Hearings for Nashoba. Um, and that, I think, will be public tomorrow. So. Carly, is there anybody on Zoom? <laughs> yeah. I just went like 90 <laughs> down my house. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any witnesses? By now I should be the media. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> okay, so I'm Melanie Hogan. Let me catch my breath. <laughs> Senator Eldridge. Uh, Representative Cena, I'm talking to all of you. Um, I know Cindy Lavin was here. Cindy Lavin was here, I believe. She just stepped out. Okay, so I've been speaking with Harley, a bunch of people. Okay, I had the privilege of watching hearings last week, and Google was an amazing thing. <laughs> you can find links, and I sent the links to a few uh, special people that I thought would be interested in this information. Um, from my own personal experience, I found it troubling that the people that represented the state of Massachusetts down in Houston, I found that the attorney of the Massachusetts Nurses Association was far more in support of keeping our hospital open. However, the attorney that was representing the state, I do not know his name. He was too complacent, and he was far too easy, uh, far too easy going with it. I found that it was troubling that somebody that would travel that far on our taxpayer, taxpaying dollars, mind you, that they're going to just sit there and be like, "Oh, no problem. We'll make sure all the patients and the doctors and all these jobs that we lose, it's going to be fine." And I remember sitting there saying. Wait a minute. <laughs> and it was about three hours long, the first hearing. And not once. And I know there were others that were watching with me. <laughs> However, not once did I hear anybody from Massachusetts state the fact that Dr. De La Torre is being subpoenaed on September 12th. And he is in constant litigations regarding international crimes that he's being investigated about. And I can't understand, now I'm not a lawyer, but my grandfather wanted me to be one. And he would be extremely proud of me today. So Grandpa Sugar, this is for you. Um, how can a bankruptcy federal judge um, go against something that's being federally investigated? So my fear, so these are questions, comments, so take it as it is. They say August 31st, correct? However, if they go ahead and close it, and then on September 12th, uh, Senator Markey, all the ones that uh, are subpoenaing him, and they start asking questions about the Shoba Valley Medical Center. Well, we're closed. Well, we need to see paperwork. We need to see what's going on here. Who's running the books? Who's doing this? Who's doing that? Oh, we're really sorry, but we closed on August 31st. So, we, you know, where is the accountability? Where is the integrity of this company? Uh, you know, I've heard he's on his boat in the middle of the Cayman Islands. And it's like, we're going to let this guy get away with it? So my fear is, Maybe this has all been going on behind closed doors. And just maybe the state has their own agenda. And even though we're trying our best to put signs up across town, which my husband and I did with our own money, and I was out yesterday in 90 degree weather, driving around town, putting up 
safe to show the hospital. Because I moved into this town 10 years ago knowing that I'd have a hospital and uh, full-time fire, police, EMS, thriving town that got closed, and now you're just gonna take our hospital away? So my fear is, is that if the governor comes in and says it's a public emergency after August 31st, how do we know that they don't have bigger plans to do something with that hospital? Whether it be a state hospital, whether it's something else. And obviously we're not privy to that. However, I think that it would be a grave mistake if Governor Haley turns her eyes to this because her election for re-election, I believe, is 2027. So I think that people need to keep that in mind. And if I can speak for uh, the families that maybe don't have good health care, that don't have the, ac uh, the access like I do, where I've had to actually leave this area and go to Boston to find better care, I have the luxury. Healthcare is a necessity, but it's also a luxury. And we can't forget the people that don't have access. So I really hope Senator Eldridge and Representative Sina and all of you, that you take your job very seriously because there's thousands of people waiting to see what we're gonna do next. And I commend you for all of your hard work, but please don't forget about the town of air. I'm next going to ask our town manager, Robert Pompgran, to say a few words. Good evening and welcome back. And as I said last week, I'll say it again, that closure is not a viable option. I think it's important what Mr. Murphy asked is, what is the plan and what are the, new, what are the next steps? And again, I think number one, we need to continue to stress that closure is not a viable option because actions do speak louder than words. And unfortunately, we've just had some rhetoric from the governor, but no action. So therefore, it looks like the plan, which they also don't have, is to let it close and let the chips fall. I hope I'm, I hope I'm wrong. But I think the key thing is that closure is not a viable option. So a couple of facts. I think we have to operate on the assumption that as we sit here on August 6th, there is no plan. And what the select board is trying to do and all of you are trying to do as far as next steps is we have to continue to put the pressure on the governor to communicate because there's been no communication since this started. We're sitting here on August 6th and the select board myself and many of you, there's been no direct communication from the governor, except when our, our nurses out in Lemonster, through the efforts of Mayor Mazzarella, were able to basically ambush her, forgive me for the term, in the hall, and got a whole 11 minutes. So the fact is, the governor keeps saying that Steward created the problem. We all know that. And what happens to Dr. Del Toro and Steward will be in the hands of the feds, the Department of Justice, Congresswoman Trahan, our US senators, he's been subpoenaed to Congress, they don't know where he is. But while all of that happens will take time, the hospital, that's not gonna save the hospital. So the governor keeps saying that Steward created this problem, not the state. I have consistently said, yes, Steward has created the problem, but governor, it is our opportunity to solve the problem. We didn't create the problem, but it is incumbent upon her and every public official from the federal level all the way down to myself and our boards and committees on the local level to solve this problem. So closure is not a viable option, we know why. We must stay that course. Secondly, the state must and can, that's the key thing, must and can solve this problem. As of now, they're choosing not to. Why? Your guess is as, as good as mine. This is an opportunity for the governor. The select board has invited her, as many of you have, to come to air, to come to the Neshoba Valley region with our federal, state, and local officials. Let's sit down and put together a plan for success. Now, what does that plan need? It needs three things immediately. One, we need a certified operator. 
And as Selectman Livingston and others said, many have brought up, well, why doesn't the town take the hostel? And the board will speak in more detail on August 20th about why eminent domain is not the proper fit for any town, not just air. Could be an option for the state, but again, that's the governor. But we need an operator to operate the hospital. We need funding. And the discussion, we know that the state has funding. And perhaps there's federal funding. And maybe there's even some local funding. I hope the select board doesn't get mad at me for saying that. But what I'm saying is we haven't even talked about that. No, we haven't sat down to talk about an operator, to talk about funding, and to talk about the plan. So the reason that the 120 days needs to be extended, and frankly, if I was the governor and I'm not, I would have asked the attorney general, right when this ruling came, to file an injunction or something. There's still been silence. The governor keeps saying it should be 120 days. Well, what is she doing? It goes back to actions speak louder than words. So the importance of the 120 days at this point is we need more time. I've talked to Dr. Perla, the, the local president up at Neshoba, the people he's talked to, how can you put together a plan in three weeks? So at least let's get the 120 days, as Senator Eldridge said, we'd like to see the governor ink that and take some action so it's not just a rhetorical um, statement. So unfortunately to Mr. Murphy's question, which is great, because I think we're all people of next steps and action is the frustrating part is we need the governor to respond, to respond to you, to respond to these towns. We need to meet, number one. Number two, we can't accept closure. You all know why, life is at stake. Closure is not a viable option, so let's take that right off the table. Meet with the governor, come up with a funding plan so that there's a transition that we can keep Neshoba operating now come up with the funding and the operator, and move to success. My final point, and I thank the chair for the opportunity. The signs are going up, which is great, and there's a banner, and there's several of them. There's one of them up outside of town hall, and it says, and I'm gonna paraphrase and I may get it wrong, in it, it says, to do what is right, not what is easy. We all know the right thing to do. We need to do it. It's not gonna be easy, Governor. It's not gonna be cheap, Governor. But in the end, it's the right thing to do. So please know that our next steps is to continue the, the, the pressure and the communication and to get the governor out here is the first step and to sit down and put together the plan moving forward. And so with that, I thank you all for all of the time and effort and know that the town of Air is with you 100% because the stakes are too high and the closure is not a viable option, must be our only position on this. Thank you. This hospital has saved my life twice. It's taking care of my kids and my wife and my friends and the kids that I've coached and that have gotten hurt on the field. This is a very important hospital. I also am in the commander of Air American Legion, and I represent a lot of senior citizens. The senior citizens need a local hospital. 
because the next heart attack could be the last if there's no hospital here. I want to make sure that the governor knows that we're all important people. It doesn't make any difference what we look like, where we're from, or who we are. We are important. Save this hospital. They're not going to know where to go. We come into our hospital as a stranger, and then they leave as family because of the nurses. And as Dr. H showed, we care about our patients. And that's what the bottom line is. And what the gentleman said it's all seniors, veterans, the ones that need the most respect. No, right now I'm looking at losing my job, but I'm caring about my, the patients that come. My husband actually has been a patient. He's looking at four major surgery. Dr. H is gonna, was going to be doing one, but now his hands are tied. So now it's like we don't know what we're going to do. Now I'm losing insurance, but my husband's health is declining. So we just need Dr. Kevin Haley to come out to the hospital and see what a great staff we have. As Audra is the best speaker who has spoken with us. Senator Oldridge, you've been by our side. We thank you all for coming. But thank you all. Most of us have primary care physicians in this area, and when we need testing, such as labs, x-rays, CAT scans, mammograms, anything like that, we do it at Neshoba. So now all these primary care physicians are gonna have to refer us to another facility, and those facilities probably already when you call to make your mammogram appointment, you're gonna wait a few weeks, a couple of months, and now you add all the population of this area calling to make appointments for those things as well and it's going to be forever to you get your appointment. So um, in addition to us just wanting to save this hospital for, as everybody has said, our family, because that's what we are, um, we need to think about consequences such as not being able to get your medical monitoring services done at the hospital. Thank you. I've been an ER doctor since 2005. I've worked at an academic medical center, a city public health hospital, suburban, and now more rural hospitals. I became an EMT when I was 16 and a half years old over in Bolton, Massachusetts. I promise you that I know what I'm talking about with respect to emergency medicine and emergency response. I'm not exaggerating when I say that some of our community members are being consigned to death by asking our injured and ill friends and family to travel an additional 25 to 30 minutes to adjacent hospitals. Not all patients have those minutes. I can think of the patients that I worked so hard with a team of nurses, techs, secretaries, everyone in the emergency department to save that life even in the back of an advanced life support ambulance, even if the ambulance isn't the third one out, mutual aid, delayed response time. Not every patient, even with the best advanced cardiac life support, can survive without the capability that we have in an emergency department sometimes. This will certainly increase mortality and suffering, and there is research that can be findable to document some of these things. The more we learn, the more we understand how the bullies of Stewart have masterminded our current abuse 
And as these days go by, we are learning how expendable we are to Governor Healy and Public Health Commissioner Goldstein. These two agencies that have the power to protect this community are choosing to say their hands are tied in the case of Governor Healy, or to say nothing in the case of Dr. Goldstein. Their decision has already seemingly been made. We don't have a chance. And it feels like the state is watching the bullies bully us. And to that, that I can speak on personally. There is nothing worse than suffering, feeling bullied, feeling like you're being beat down. And people are actually standing around and watching. That feeling of they know what we're going to lose. They know that over 110,000 people are going to have compromised health care, creating a relative care desert in Massachusetts. They know that, and yet still, the silence. And silence resonates. Across the state, people are thinking they must be okay with it. Locally, fire chiefs, EMS directors understand exactly what's going on here. But at the state level, I think they think, well, we'll work it out. You know, other hospitals have closed. We'll work it out. It'll be fine. Where is the feisty fight from them? Where's the outrage? How dare they do this to this community? How dare they inflict this upon my patients, Dr. Harris Moitz's patients, all of the physicians' patients, the nurses, the, the attention, the text, the amount of love that comes from a community hospital taking care of a patient is why I choose to work in a community hospital. I prefer to work in a community hospital. I have never been in a place that is more loving and caring and supportive for the patients that come through our doors. I'm hoping that we can start to hear a feisty fight from other communities, from boards of health, from other town managers, from, from Springfield, from Boston, from Worcester, from other hospital agencies that say, you know what, closing a community hospital is always a bad idea. And regardless of politics, regardless of money, we can stand up and say closing a community hospital is a bad idea. Everyone should be clamoring, absolutely not. Because if this can happen in our community, it can happen in any community. And thank you to everyone who is here, who showed up in this room, everyone behind me, who are the people clamoring and saying this is not okay. Because closure is definitely not a viable option. Any other speakers? Um, before we adjourn, I'd like to thank State Representative uh, Senate, State Senator Jamie Eldridge, Board Member Livingston, Board Member Tavares, and Town Manager Pomperans. There's nothing else? Yes. <laughs> Anyway, and find out if it actually gets solved. I, I just think if it's, it has to have happened some. So I would just encourage you to look. Chair? Yes, for me. Nothing else so that we can get this letter sent. I move that we adjourn. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Chair says aye. And I've never used this, but adjourn. Okay.